Okay, so Dan Corbin is a proven product management leader, passionate about helping companies improve their strategy and operations. He has extensive experience as a product management instructor, mentor, and coach. Over his multi-decade career, Dan has led a wide variety of product and design teams across various industries. He's also dedicated to helping people achieve their career goals and assisting those making a career transition. Okay, so Dan, you can take it away. All right, so I'm not as used to WebEx. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of like, I don't have my whole field advantage here. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm just gonna like share everything. Uh, uh, allow, yeah, sure, you can. Uh, wait, hang on, share. I gotta open up my system preferences. All right, so while we're doing that, how's everyone go? How's everyone doing? <laughs> We're barely uh, surviving the heat here in Texas. I think oh we my gosh. set a new record yesterday. So there's that and it's only June. So speaking for the Texas folks here, yeah, it's been rough. <laughs> so that's the one thing that I was really excited about, uh, like uh, <laughs> leaving Texas, the fact that I uh, was gonna get out of the heat. It's, it's like 80 degrees here. And uh, so nice. And just like, we got out of the airport, we walked in and like, I was like, just this weather makes it worth the trip. Oh, I bet. That's what summer should be like 80 degrees. I saw yesterday in an article that I read that it was like 117 was the heat index yesterday. So yeah, and Trey, you said, yeah, it's like records on records. Every year, it seems like we break a new record. So it's a lot. Uh all right, so I have to log off and log it back on. I'll be back in one second. Okay. Again, okay. talk about like, all right, here's, I actually have a, um, a a question. So one of the questions I was going to do a breakout room is I really wanted to know, what are you hoping to get from this? Like, I'm going to explain like why I chose this topic. What, what I'm really interested in is what are you most interested in learning? And then also what tools have you already, what AI tools have you already been using to kind of help automate your work? So talks amongst yourselves. I'll be back in just a second. And then I'll, I, I'm just kind of like, you know, I want to hear from you. What are you hoping to learn? Cause, and, uh, and then also what AI you're already using and then we'll kind of kick it off from there. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. Well, I know I am personally a big chat GPT fan. I would say the most helpful it's been for me is in writing cover letters. So I am just pasting in like job descriptions and my resume and I feel like it can generate a really killer kicking off point. Now I never just like copy and paste it and use it directly from chat GPT, but I feel like that's been a really good use case is to kind of help it, you know, pair my resume with some of these jobs that I've been applying to. Um, but I haven't dabbled in too much other AI. I want to get more, you know, it was Kelly who was mentioning using like a system that can do your slide decks for you or things like that. I haven't really delved into much other AI besides chat GPT. What about y'all? We use Grammarly really pretty heavily. Okay. So the yeah. thing that's handy is that sometimes the thing that's really funny is you stop thinking about using AI, but then you use Google translate pretty heavily. Or what have you there's a lot of like really narrow ais that really solve problems that if you stop using them you would notice uh google lens is also remarkably useful and people don't usually think about that function on their phone but the ability to look something up and figure out exactly what it is and where to find it uh can be oddly superpower level yeah i've never even heard of that one google lens i'm jotting these down it's a it's an AI search system based off of pictures. Okay, cool. So you just yeah. take a picture and your phone goes, hey, I found these other versions of it or things that look like it. And you can like find pieces of furniture or artists or things like that just by taking a photo. Oh, that's it's been around cool. for years. But people don't think to use it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, Dan, I see that you have joined again. I made you co-host and I enable breakout sessions. So we have four breakout rooms available. Okay. So how many people we have total? Like right now, it's just a few of us. Okay. Uh, we probably won't do like, uh, you know, if you came here hoping just to kind of hang out and not talk much and just kind of be a fly in the wall, 
this is your time to discreetly leave the meeting because I really do oh. want this to be a discussion because I think the collective knowledge, I mean, if you're just listening to me for the next, you know, 45, 50 minutes, probably not the best <laughs> use of your time. Uh, I have, I'm happy to share what I know, the tools that I've looked at, uh, and, you know, I am deep into AI, but, you know, I think it's going to be uh, helpful if we all kind of share what we've learned and just some, any, just in general. All right. So what I'm going to do is we're going to kick off. So uh, you can see my screen and everything. Yes. Okay. So I really decided on this topic I, again. Uh, thank you, Casey, for the introduction. I, I now I'm an instructor at Pragmatic. I've been teaching product management primarily for the last eight years or so. Uh, I've worked at a variety of different companies in all different types of areas. I've done B2B, B2C, B2B to C, B2D, which is business to developers. Uh, I've worked on uh, AI machine learning products. I've worked on Chrome extensions, uh, mobile products, every single product out there in a lot of different industries. Um, but now I just kind of like share what I've learned over the years and we're going to go over the overviews and objectives. This is kind of what I'm hoping you're going to take away from this session. Uh, we'll see. We'll see at the end. You can tell me if, if we, if I failed miserably on these or not. So the topics that I chose were, first of all, I wanted to discuss why I chose this topic. Now I work with, um, I teach a design class. I've worked with a lot of design teams over the years. Um, but you know, my expertise is primarily in product management. And I wanted to talk specifically about the struggles and challenges I see when product and design teams are working together. Now, when you add in this whole new element and this whole new variable of AI, you know, it kind of makes it even more challenging, but it doesn't have to. And that's really why I wanted to kind of dive into this. So we're going to talk about like, all right, where those intersections are, where product and design work together, things like um, personas, journey maps, when you're doing user research, and then when you're just trying to do ideation and evaluation and brainstorming, we'll have questions. Uh, and then one of the things I thought would be helpful is just to share all the resources that I've been using. Um, I set aside every time for AI and it's, not, it's actually very, it's not hard to do because there's a lot of information out there. You just kind of have to know where to go. So I missed the first discussion. Oh, I, I, uh, We'll get to that. All right, so why this topic? A lot of times you get, a, one of the common questions I get is, hey, we're trying to work with our product team and dot, 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 or we're trying to work with the designers. And sometimes there's confusion or not lack of clarity around roles and responsibilities. Who is gonna take the lead on this? Who is going to uh, support them? Who might just be our participant? So one of the things that I teach in my design class is this responsibility matrix. And it's, we go through and I teach about provisional personas and Nikito. Now Nikito is an acronym that stands for nothing important happens in the office. It's just our pragmatic way of saying, you have to go out and talk to people where, where they're experiencing the problems. Just, you know, sitting in your office saying like, oh, you know what, wouldn't people love a dot, dot, dot? Well, you know what, it'd be really great or just, projecting your own thoughts and feelings and wants upon your target market. Obviously, we know that that's a pretty shitty way to go about doing your job. So it's just something that we weave through all of our classes. Uh, we talk about user research, uh, refined personas, which you know, I'm gonna tap in, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between provisional and refined. That's where I really want, would love to get your feedback and pushback if you think uh, uh, my approach is uh, maybe not the best way. And then you see other areas. So what is, why I really recommend product and design teams sit down and fill out this responsibility matrix is it starts to clarify who is taking the lead, who is going to support them. And then maybe who might not, you know, I may not be as actively involved, but I am going to participate. And it's good to involve development as well, because there are certainly areas where all three different, um, you know, uh, uh, groups kind of overlap and you want to work really collaboratively. So this is something that is a takeaway from a lot of my classes, but I thought it would be a good topic for this discussion. Now, as I already mentioned, I wanted to know how you're using AI and I heard a little bit of Google Lens and things like that. Um, we can continue this discussion throughout the presentation. What I wanna know is if I go over something, 
if you have already used this, where did I put my phone? Okay, here we go. If you've already used the tool or use something similar or have any questions or recommendations, please stop and interrupt me. Again, if I'm just, well, first of all, if I just talk nonstop for the next hour, the people in the Starbucks are gonna be pretty fucking pissed. <laughs> uh, already, I think I'm getting some dirty lips. Uh, so please do participate. All right, so let's talk about personas uh, or AI for personas and user journeys. Now, this is where I would love your feedback. The way that I have expected my teams and the way that I teach persona development is you start off with a provisional persona. You take what you think you know about your, your target users, you know, your user persona, your buyer persona. You do additional research and then you come up with your refined persona. So the, the provisional persona is, it's really just an internal hypothesis. So you have a lot of knowledge up in your brain and in your company, you probably had a lot of information about your, um, uh, your, your different, you know, your potential users and really what you do with the, uh, the provisional persona is you just get that on paper. What are their problems? What are their goals? What are their background information? What are their behaviors? Then you take this and you know that this is an internal hypothesis. You know that you're making assumptions, but as you develop this, you record those assumptions and say, all right, these are the assumptions I'm making. This is what I need to go out and either validate or invalidate. So it's helpful to um, you know, make an interview guide as you're doing this. So you, you come up with what you think you know about your users, you create the user guide, then, you know, after this, you go out and you actually do uh, the interviews. After you go out, you do that qualitative uh, research, you maybe you followed up with some quantitative research, maybe sending out surveys or things like that, doing other research. Then you create your persona. And you'll notice that the persona says it's based on patterns. So this means this is patterns that you observe when you are out doing your research. Um, and you never want your persona to be based on um, like just assumptions. You don't want it to be based on stereotypes either. Stereotypes oftentimes are meant to demean, but if you're using a persona, it's meant to generate empathy. So that may, it has to be, you have to be rooted in facts and data, not just stereotypes and assumptions. So this is going to be your uh, validated and refined version. It's going to be the kind of polished version that you're going to share within your organization. One of the terms we use is this concept of outside in. Always starting at the outside with your customers and your buyers and their problems and needs. And then bringing that information in and using that information to make your decisions. So if you're always referring to your personas, uh, and making sure that you're looking at things from that perspective, through that lens, then um, you know, you're going to be more, you're gonna have more empathy throughout your organization for your users, and you're gonna build better products based on my experience. Um, all right, so before we get into that, any thoughts on that? Is there anything that, like, that I said in terms of going from the, well, let me ask this. Are, 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 are you right now doing both refined and, uh, excuse me, provisional and kind of finalized refined versions of personas? By the way, I can't see many people. <laughs> if you could come go. off mute and talk, that would be better. <laughs> hey, hey, Dan, Ron Giblin, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Great. So we tend to use, and I'm in industry, so, you know, cohorts, you know, targeted okay. cohorts that are the, the, the basic um, groupings of um, consumer or people groups, right, yeah. uh, that represent the spectrum of spend within our persona ranking system. Yep. Okay. And so that's typically how we think about um, the utilization of persona. I do like the hypothetical uh, development here. And then um, perhaps, I guess, you go and uh, research that a bit to, to validate and refine it. I'd like to learn how you see the application of the tools that we're talking about today to assist yeah. in those roles. Yeah. That's the, and you're going to see why I preface with this, because there's 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 a slippery slope where you can just decide to like go off purely the AI version 
And my concern is, are you getting away from going and finding out and seeing those ex established patterns and really just trusting what the AI is telling you? Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and so beginning to leverage Experian or other, let's call it, um, you know, uh, profile models for households or individuals, uh, census track level, depending on how you define your economic or market areas, right? Um, then certainly, um, I think coming to the ask around validation, which you were about to get into, is that how you look at reconciling it? Or what is your method of reconciliation and remedy, and in some cases, perhaps um, training? So, well, you know, I'll get into that because I, I'm going to show you how, like, I'm teaching and most of the teams I've worked with have done this, but then let me, I'm going to dive into like, what might the future look like with AI? But Ron, I think I want to circle back with you offline about your uh, persona prioritization model. That is a, that is a question I get a lot of my classes. So I, I, I want to pick your brain on that. Well, let's keep going here. Actually, anyone else uh, want to chime in and share, tell us, share how your, uh, your, your personas are created or evolved? I think there's a really good point that you make here over the provisional versus yeah. anything that's tested and the idea that anything that's provisional does not leave the group in many ways. They're your nest initial guesses. They're worth what they're written on. Um, yep. You're really just trying to get your, you're, in some ways, you're trying to quantify the things that you don't know. Um, yep. Yep. Putting a position out. It's the case that if you don't have a position and you can't talk about how you changed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what I can say is when we've been doing our refined personas, we've actually been doing more uh, service design blueprints instead of personas specifically. Because I okay. think that what I'm going for when we're doing work with personas isn't developing empathy about the person, but developing an understanding and appreciation of context. What's yeah. happening to them in the other case? I don't necessarily have to, the goal isn't necessarily to make me identify with them and care about what they're doing, but to understand why, what's happening to them, what's going to affect them. Yep. Um, being able to identify the things that are going to be the most salient for them and when they happen. Um, because you know, I can get this whole backstory, but if this persona thing doesn't tell me, hey, they're gonna ha they're have a gap between these two contact points. These two touch points have a long period with no update. Or yeah. this this needs to be a system that's passed from one group to another, and these two groups touch them, but they don't see each other. Um, things like that. So it's like put it in their terms, very much outside in. But we've been doing more service design blueprint approach but definitely validating against the people rather than just, oh, this is what we think. Yep. And you're absolutely right. Like, obviously there's a ton of value you can get from personas, but it's only so much context. You do like service, to, you're using uh, the service design, designs, uh, but also the you know, user journey maps or things like that. That teams need that context as well. They need to understand, yes, okay, I understand Gerard Johnson and I understand, but tell me how would he react in this situation? What are the things he's facing? So, mm -hmm. all right, good. Well, I'm glad that this approach kind of, you know, uh, is generally like what most people are doing on the call. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start diving in. And the first thing we're going to look at is a tool called Coco. So Coco is a, uh, it's a Figment plugin. Is anyone familiar with Coco? It's spelled Q-O-Q-O. -Q -O. Okay, so Trey, you 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 uh, have you played around with this or just I'm maybe familiar just it? with it? I know that it's been existed, but I haven't been able to play with it or see it in any of my particular work yet. Okay, we're gonna go through and we're gonna we're gonna do one really quickly. So let me see if I can come over here and uh, how do I get this? I want this at the bottom. I can't see my stuff. Okay. So let's go in, let's go to Coco. So this again, Figma plugin, I'm gonna go down to Persona. Uh, so, and really what you could do is, it, 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 this is just with, when I, one of the things I like about tools like Coco is it can get you started on stuff. You can start, you know, helping you come up with your drafts pretty quickly. And that way, that way you're just having, having to write everything from scratch. So let's say that, um, you know, instead of, uh, what is it, a full stack engineer, let's just say that I'm a 18 to 24 year old college student. Uh, and uh, instead of this, you know, let's say in a major US city, 
and let's say that um, what is the scenario? I need a uh, you know place to study off campus. Actually, I think I wrote this down so because my typing is so bad. <laughs> I'm such a horrible typer, like typing in, uh, oops, I did not want that. Here we go. All right, so what this is, and I said, you know, just 18 to 24 year old college student in New York's major city. I'm in a Starbucks right now. So the student needs a relaxing place off campus and out of the dorm to read, study, and can complete homework. She wants a place that has a variety of drinks, affordable snacks. So she'll be spending at least a few hours there each visit. All right, so if that's her problem, uh, let's start, look, see what it is. Now you can see here, they've already started to kind of generate things. All right, what are her uh, user goals? What are the user needs? And they generate 10 of each. So all of this is kind of going off the fly. What are her motivations? What are her frustrations uh, when she's looking for some place just to kind of hang out and study and read? What tasks, what opportunities? All right, so they've gone and they've created this persona and then Oops, stop, stop generation, sorry. Uh, here it is. So it kind of puts it out there for you. And you can see like, if this is the tool that you're using a lot, you can say like, hey, I need a break from uh, campus life, but I still want to be productive. So you can go in there and like look in here. So like, and you can see that they come up with things, which if you were to, you know, based upon the very little amount of information that you gave them, these all make sense. You know, I want comfortable seatings, Maybe I want to network with other students, uh, maybe affordable prices or, you know, and so there's lots of different things. Uh, you can get into their needs. One of the things I kind of like about uh, this is they come up with opportunities. Um, and now this is something I typically don't talk about or expect to see always with a, um, you know, when you're generating your persona, maybe it is, but there's these opportunities based upon the persona we just uh, talked about in her scenario. Maybe she wants to meet with other people. Maybe she wants to discover new habits and techniques. Maybe she wants to try like the Pomodoro technique because that'll help eliminate distractions as she's trying to focus on one um, topic. She wants to, you know, all of these things you can see. Maybe she wants to explore new areas. So, and then it, obviously it gives you other areas to kind of put this in. So this is just a really easy, quick tool where if you're like brainstorming and you just want to start thinking about the user personas and if, you know, Figma happens to be your tool of choice, this is a really uh, nice tool uh, to kind of use. Any questions, comments on just how they, they kind of put together that uh, user story so quickly? Or yeah, I'm not sorry, you, user persona, not sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, this this sounds similar to uh, a tool that I haven't used, which is synthetic users, and was mentioned earlier during the yeah. one of the panel discussions. Um, how close is that to this? And you know, how did you validate all this? Ah, yes. This is kind of what I really wanted to talk about. I almost feel like you're just like you know serving me up softballs because that's exactly the points I wanted to make. Now, with synthetic. <laughs> Been set, oh my gosh, synthetic users. They are producing what they're kind of saying, like, here, these are refined personas. And that's one of the things I'm going to show next is how that works and what is the difference. The reason that I gravitated to this was it gave you a starting point. And then if you were with your team, you know, and you're saying, like, oh, is this, you know, based upon, you know, we know we're, we, we're starting a new coffee shop. We're in this city. We're right by, you know, I'm right. I'm by Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University. If we're trying to get them to come off campus and use ours, maybe we've already talked to them and we know some of these user goals. And like we could say, yes, that feels right. Or actually, I'm not sure about this, but let's keep it in there because when we go out and we do further research, we can either validate or invalidate that. So the approach here is this is really a refine, excuse me, a provisional persona. And then you go out and you do the additional research to, you know, make sure that, all right, this actually passed muster. With synthetic, oh my gosh, <laughs> why can't I say that? What is in this child? Oh, you know what it was? I had, when you're in Nashville, you have to go for hot chicken sandwiches. 
So I went for a hot chicken sandwich and I ordered medium and I've been sweating ever since. So hot. Uh, probably the beer I had with lunch isn't helping either. Anyway, uh, synthetic, synthetic, oh my gosh. The other one, they, they, it's much more comprehensive and I'll show you what that looks like. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I get tongue tied when I'm presenting, but I'm like never this bad. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go back to the presentation. Um, the other thing actually I do wanna show with this is, okay, so say we've done that. Now we're gonna go and we're gonna do, uh, pull up the plugin again. And let's say that, you know, we've got Emily, our, our persona, and we just wanna do a typical user like uh, map for her. So we'll just say, you know, again, And it's another college student in a major US city who wants basically the same thing. So what they're gonna do now is when I press generate, it's gonna start creating that user map. And this is, again, this is really just a draft of it. So this is what, according to the AI, they think that user would do the different steps. Um, but again, you know, it gives you some really good things. And if you were to go through each of these, the frustrations, the user tax, the pain points, the opportunities, each stage, um, you would probably uh, find some things. Yep, I would expect that. But they, what I like about uh, Coco is it just also be like, oh yeah, that actually, that is a good idea. I, I forgot about that. That has helped happen to me. So it just kind of helps prime the pump. It isn't a replacement for doing the actual user research done. So let's give it that. Now, what it's doing is it's giving the different phases and each phase it's giving like pain points, needs, opportunities, motivations, frustrations. So right now we're at the phase five, uh, ad loyalty and advocacy. So I'm in a Starbucks. I use my, you know, Starbucks points. Uh, no, not points, but I use my card. I'm sure I have enough points to get a coffee now if I want. Phase six is potential expansion to other areas maybe. So do you see like, this is pretty comprehensive. If you were to think about, if you were just to draw, do your first draft of all of this, this would take a while, but obviously, you know, it put together this uh, thing pretty quickly. So you know what's power in this? Is it open AI? Um, it is. So underneath, now they have their own, and I totally overrode everything here, but that's fine. Uh, so I'm not going to dive into that. But like, yes, so the back end is OpenAI. Now they, when they are ingesting your prompts, they are doing some, you know, of their kind of secret sauce stuff on the back end in order to gather uh, the best results. So they are, you know, obviously, you know, the same way you're like act as a dot dot dot, or you know, so it, they have done a lot of testing and prompts. And they feel that they've come up with a good way to generate the results for these different uh, tools. All right. How are we doing on time? Are we a little halfway? Okay. What yes, we're at doing? 30 minutes. Uh, any questions, thoughts, comments, reactions to Coco? Uh, which you did mention something that I, I don't know what it is. It's uh, we can implement the Pomodoro technique. When you oh, were talking yeah. about the first, what is that? Uh, so the Pomodoro technique, if I can just, how do I get this? Okay, so the Pomodoro technique is just a way, it's just a productivity technique where you see how like you have, like what I was working on last night was my, like the a specific section of this. So it's just a way of breaking your work down and then you work in 30 minute increments or like 25, 25 minutes of focused work and then five minutes where you get to kind of you know, go check email, check your Slack, check, check your text messages. So you basically shut down everything else and only focus on what, you know, things you're doing. So I was going through just coming up with more examples of user doc notably and this other word I can't pronounce. And then when I'm done, I move it over here. And it's just a way for me to kind of, you know, figure out what I'm working on. It's, I just have a very, like, I'm kind of like, a, I like to be very efficient when I work. Uh, Cause I don't want, want to work uh, any more than I have to. So this is a technique that works for me. 
Excellent. Yeah. If you can share something on how to do it, I will love that at the end. Oh, okay. Well, I'll send you a whole, I've done a presentation on it's called personal productivity and different tools you can use. So I'll just slack that to you directly. Excellent. And Thank anyone you. else who wants it, I, I'll include it in the resources at the, in this deck as well. Oh, wait, Trey, what do you say you structure? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good. All right, Trey, 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 I really like Trey. Trey just keeps reinforcing and, you know, kind of plus one what I'm saying here. So I feel like Trey is again a plant helping me through this presentation. Yeah, I need, we need to guess, you, you guys need to partner it up and put something together. <laughs> All right, Trey, take away this next slide. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not going to dive into this because this one, this one I like a little bit more. And well, in theory. So what this does is it goes through and it'll take like your Google analytics and other analytics data. It'll utilize that to create personas and then also segments of users that you might have. So what I like about this approach is rather than just giving a, hey, college student, this, that, it actually looks at your actual data. And this is where I think it should be going the direction. You know, there's, I'm sure there's been talks in the other sessions about creating your own LLMs and like one of the things we're doing at Pragmatic is we've been around for 30 years. And, you know, I've only been there for a little under, like for, you know, about a year and a half. And there, but there's 30 years of data. So what we're going to do is we're going to have put all of that information into an LLM and create chatbots and things like that. That way I can, I can ask and uh, interview and quiz our entire knowledge of our history. Uh, you know, our entire, everything that we've ever, you know, kind of compiled. I'm sure you've had instances where people have done a bunch of interviews and then um, they left the company and a lot of that information left with them because it's up in their brain or it's buried in some documents that people don't remember. Well, with AI, you can gather that all together and then you can just have a conversation with your entire company's knowledge history over the years. And that's what I kind of think like uh, they're doing here is they're basing it on your data. So if you have a lot of analytics data, uh, maybe check out uh, Delve.ai. So let's go next to user docs. So this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, if I can find it here. Okay, it should be. All right, let's create a project. Um, so we're going to create the name of this project is going to be. Uh, Tail wagger tagger. All right. And uh, it's it's a mobile app. Okay, so what it is, it's just a mobile app that allows you to take a picture of a dog so you can identify the breed. This is just something I was thinking about, like my daughter and I, like she wants me to go around. She wants me to send her pictures from Nashville, but not pictures of me or not pictures from the festival I'm going to. She just wants pictures of different dogs. <laughs> and I've been instructed if it's a homeless dog, I have to bring it home. So maybe if I had this app called Tail Wagger Tiger, uh, I could, you know, find out like what type of, you know, dog these are. Uh, so what is the user type of a tail wagger tagger? Um, so, you know, maybe it's an urban or suburban dog lover and dog owner. Um, how would they use it? Um, they would use it. Uh, to identify dog breeds at the dog park uh, when out on walks and um, when, I don't know, visiting the dog shelter. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use uh, user doc AI. So it says, let's bring some motions in. So what are the frustrations? Uh, 
Uh, don't focus on the features. Focus on the humans and what they care about. They love dogs, but they um, don't have an easy way to uh, identify different breeds. You know, which is frustrating. I don't know that it really is. All right, so the next part is like walk us through their user journey. Now you'll notice like it, it, this differs from Coco in a bit in that it's gathering all the information up front. Then it's going to spill out this entire project for you to use. Um, all right, so describe a user journey. Uh, they head out for their morning walk and cast multiple dogs. Um, they also visit the so they also visit the dog park. We'll just keep it short. All right, so we're going to generate the report now. So what it's going through is it's creating all your user docs. So it's going to create like user stories and a persona. Uh, it may be like a I believe it's like a, a the user journey as well. So we'll give that a minute uh, to to generate. All right, so now we've got this app and you can just kind of go through and say, all right, here are the uh, users, the user types. So they came up with the first uh, persona, which is Samantha Lee. Talks about where she's from, about her goals, uh, and then some of her frustrations. Uh, we also have uh, Josh Nguyen, who's in uh, San Francisco. He's a software engineer. Kind of takes us a journey. You can see the journey of the two people. Um, you know, as she opens the app, she takes a picture of a dog and identifies it. She goes to dog parts. Maybe she adds it to her, uh, you know, like, oh, you know what? The next time I get a dog, I think I might like, I want to consider that breed. Um, this is kind of like what my, my, you know, my daughter and I would use something like this for, although she literally would, you know, have every single breed possible. Um, so again, gives you the, the, uh, the journey, it just kind of generates it for you. So this is kind of like, uh, you know, another tool that you could use, kind of automate, it kind of helps uh, just get you faster, get you up and running a little bit faster. The one thing with this is I think you have to do everything in user doc. And I don't know, you know, has anyone used this before? I feel like I'm looking at Trey. <laughs> Trey, have you used this before at all? <laughs> no, but I'm going to, that's for sure. I it's, use a large is, volume of tools specifically, so it's yeah. a lot, a little bit more classic. <laughs> um, so you can even see, like, you know, it goes through and it'll give you user stories. And like now, I don't know if you're like a Jira shop and you're using, you know, Jira and Confluence and stuff like that. I don't know that it really integrates, but you know, it does a good job of kind of building out user stories, acceptance criteria, uh, things like that. Again, you know, back when I was uh, starting off as a product manager, a lot of this stuff is the time I'm like, oh, I got to just sit and crank out all this stuff. But now with AI, it allows you to generate this stuff with snap of the fingers. Um, okay, so I, I've added in discussion things here. I think we've kind of touched on this one already. Um, and this is really, this is the one at the bottom that I was most interested in is, do you, do you agree that just that AI alone should be used to create your, your refined personas? Uh, but the one thing I will say, I'm not, just because we only got 15 minutes left with uh, Coco, you can also, if you were, wanted to, you could then generate interview questions for your persona. So this is one, uh, again, similar to the, the example that I used in Coco. I said I'm an 18 to 24, you know, four-year-old university student, and it not only generates the questions that, you know, based upon the information you fed it earlier, it also kind of gives you a little bit of a starting, uh, you know, script. Thanks for accepting the time to meet us with today. I'm Dan Corbin, and I'm from Pragmatic Institute. We're conducting this interview to understand customers better, you know, 
basically, you know, just making sure that they're at ease and they know nothing that they say is wrong. Everything that they say is actually really useful to us, all of that. Well, let's go down to uh, synthetic users. Nailed it right out of the gate. Yes, thank you. This one is really interesting. Um, and this is the one where I'm like, uh, it starts to feel a little bit uh, sketchy to me, but see if I can get it going here. So does anybody have an audience that they want to, you know, do, I mean, I could use the example I just used and, or come up with something, but does anyone have anyone, any, one that they want to try? You saying like as far as a user audience that we would want to do testing with? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, because I was going to say like if you want to, uh, you know what? Why don't we do this? Let's do a walkthrough, and I'll just kind of walk you through how this works. So again, we like we we'll, we can just stick with uh, dog lovers. Uh, oops. Okay. <laughs> Okay, why is it doing this? Uh, sorry. Let's do it. Like maybe this, uh, I haven't done this before. We're just gonna do it on the fly. So this, like what it should be doing is coming up with uh, where I can click on the, for some reason, I'm not able to generate the interviews. Let me try, give me one second here. I noticed that the, in the in the cards, mm -hmm. do you see those radial boxes? Can you click on those right right above? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you need to select the criteria, maybe. Uh, okay. There you go. There. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's just say like we're gonna generate like three three interviews. <coughs> So it's kind of preparing that now. But this is, this one is kind of interesting. So at the end of the uh, the deck, I have some just, you know, warnings, you know, and like one of them is just be careful because AI can lie to you in very convincing ways. Now you'll notice that it's generating a lot of information. It's having all of like these deep interviews with Ahmad uh, and describing his problems, all of his challenges, there is a ton of information that they're they putting in here. And, you know, it's clear that they have a pretty, you know, robust, uh, you know, LLM kind of generating off of this and being able to do this for, you know, Ahmad and Anna. Uh, and then the fact that, you know, you can take all of this various information, all of these challenges that these people are having in long distance relationships. And then when this finishes, you're gonna be able to click a report and it's gonna summarize everything. So this is the type of thing that it would say like, all right, imagine if you were to go out and do all of this research, talk to all of these people, pull all this information in, and then just say, all right, now synthesize all of that information and create a report. Okay, well, this is what we think. So this basically, you know, you think about you know, user research designers, they're out doing things, they're talking to all these people. If you can just go to uh, synthetic users, and do this and yes you can get this report and i bet you it does look right but this is where i start to worry like all right are people is this too much of a shortcut like how based in reality is this i would be okay if they took the tools and the technology for this and it was going into your historical all of the information all the people that you had interviewed over the years like let me give you an example so I used to work for HEB Digital and I oversaw different groups there and we had different personas and we would always be going out interviewing people. So we had personas like one was, was like the, uh, the provider. So it was the person who was responsible for 
you know, usually with a family, um, maybe, you know, he or she were, is the one that is, does the grocery shopping, does, usually does dinners, make sure that you get food that's healthy or that's certain that the kids will actually eat. So we have hundreds of interviews that we could go and, you know, put that into a model and then maybe we could pull out reports like this or something like that because we have lots of information. But this, none of my data is actually hooked up to this. This is just like, this is what we think this type of user would use. So at this point, let me pause. What do you guys think about this? Does this, does this kind of, you know, like feel a little sketchy to you or does it uh, feel like, no, this is awesome. I like, I would use this right away. It seems really cool. This is Casey, by the way, if you can't see me. Um, I think it seems awesome. I definitely want to play with some of these. But my thought is always, does having AI do these types of tasks in UXR, does it kind of just take away some of that empathy piece that's so important and crucial to doing this research in the first place? I think taking away the human element, does that compromise it at all? Yeah, I, I'd like to build on that, Casey, which is yeah. the double diamond process of the divergent convergent, right? And so where does it fit in that context and flow? I think, you know, in um, studying innovation and structured innovation, I think this is a great methodology because what it does is it primes the room. I think you can, let's say, use it as a leadership tool to engage uh, people who are just not, let's say, used to participating uh, in, you know, the elicitation, ideation, sparking moments, uh, ranking and uh, prototyping, let's say, um, sequences, right? So I do think it can be very effective there. Um, but I do feel it's too, there's too much on the bone here to inspire the type of creativity through socialization that tends to occur in a room, just for me, anyway. Yeah. I think one of the things that also sticks out to me, though, is there's a lot of stuff they throw in there, like too much meat on the bone. Nobody talks like this. Which of your interviews sound like this? Um, yeah. And normally when you're having to do interviews, you're having to do follow-ups, you're going to have to dig and expand and have them come back around. They never have it condensed the first time. And usually they'll rephrase themselves, contradict themselves, come back around, come to a new insight from it. And that's where a lot of the most useful stuff comes from. It's very rarely the first thing they tell you, but a lot of this stuff sounds like the first thing you'll hear from somebody. Well, if I, I might add to that, you know, in um, doing um, AI over sentiment analysis, right, and um, being able to take uh, unstructured data, analyze it for topics, intention, sentiment, all the other elements we do in corporate uh, management for um, journey work. Um, Emotion is momentary. And in dealing with healthcare, for example, on uh, the HFMA model, which is about um, revenue um, cycles and uh, patient journeys that impact revenue cycle, what is reported widely in healthcare is that because of the amount of time and the temporal aspect of experiences. I might have an experience in getting an appointment, but it'll be several weeks before I actually have the clinical experience, right? Mm -hmm. And then it'll be several weeks before I have the billing experience. And the challenge is that, you know, you can't necessarily ask for an overall rating when you're four weeks in, and it was really the billing experience that killed the experience, right? You lose that. And in this idea of elicitation within uh, even groups I've led is what is emotional one day may not be emotional the next day. So the phenomenological management and writing of this information, you know, if you study Bain and others, uh, and then the hedonic and eudaimonic aspect of, you know, journey work, right? And then semiotic management. I, you know, I, I know, I know <laughs> there's somebody nodding their head who's, you know, at that level, but um, and so I, but again, I think it's still from a standpoint of um, where we're at in the market today and getting, and because, you know, if you've ever owned horses, there's a golden rule about horse training. You can't train a horse that won't move its feet. And <laughs> this is a great get your feet moving tool. I see it in this yes. way. And I, I, yeah, so. And that's, and Ron, Sorry. that's generally yeah. like the, the approach that I've been doing because I, I think like both you and Trey are making great points and it's 
I worry about it, but I also know that like people will be like, oh, I didn't think about that. But I would like this was my team. I would I would say you're still going out and you're still going to do the research. But if you want to use this for insights and you know, tell me what your learnings are. But if I find you're just doing this or you're not actually going out and talking to our real customers, I would have concerns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if I might, the people aren't random. I think it's enough. a good yeah. reference point for sure. And as you said, it's a primer for those that maybe aren't familiar. And I kind of look at it, you know, like for example, if you're building a house, uh, you know, you may get the blueprints of someone that come in and say, "Hey, we had someone with your kind of layout or something similar. This is what we put together." And I kind of look at this as a reference point like that, where. It could be used either for those uh, voices you're trying to get, or even for stakeholders where they may not be familiar with the type of work that we do. And being able to show this some example as you know the resources needed for these type of projects. Yeah. yeah. If I can add one other layer here, because you know the rest of the world, I'm writing a book right now on the future of work, and you know Trey and I'll probably connect a little later on this, but which is, you know, as a systems guy with business principles in the background, and I'm talking about the impact of automation, uh, other than the MIT analysis at the task level, all that, right? Um, is this, um, can I increase the quality of decisioning? In the quality of decisioning, I do allocation, I do blueprint for resolution, and I also do timing of putting those resources in motion. So if I can increase the quality of decisioning, then I increase the fidelity of execution and then velocity of assembly. If I can actually use, and this is where I'm seeing this tool, uh, mm -hmm. this tool to increase the ability of the assembly steps to go more quickly, I now have another economic component in play. Yeah. And then finally, the third principle is defect-free curation. If I can actually perform the quality <laughs> of decisioning and allocation and the velocity of assembly, and then finally, when I get to the curation portion, where I actually have a consumable that's ready for the next downline consumer, even think diversion conversion process, right? Where I'm handing off pieces developed in the divergent process to the convergent process itself, right? Now the question is, um, if I have more uh, fidelity and better quality, uh, does that actually increase uh, capital flow, economic flow? And the answer to that, when you design in this manner is generally yes. So when I evaluate these technologies, that's my frame. Not only the idea of it sparking ideation and prototyping and all the other great things that come with innovation, but it's economic impact within the process chain. Well, I look forward to like uh, reading the book. It sounds great. And a lot of like we were talking, especially like just being able to, the velocity which you can automate and kind of compile this stuff. But I only have two minutes left, so I just want to go through yep. I wasn't quite sure like how much stuff I was going to go through, but other tools you might want to check out. I really like Craftful. Uh, it allows you to ingest all of these different areas of uh, user feedback so that you can start surfacing up insights. Uh, AI is great for that. There's notably, um, you know, and then I started to go through and obviously ChatGPT is the best thing. I, I think it's great for ideation. You can come up with so many things. If you're using, uh, I recommend ChatGPT plus go in utilize the playground like uh and you know check out chat tpt4 versus 3.5 i try to use it like as much as i can every day um in terms of next steps common warnings the concept of keep a human in the loop don't just have ai generate something copy and paste it use it you're gonna it's gonna come back and bite you in the ass i promise you consider data privacy and confidentiality uh, know that it's going to hallucinate and confidently lie to you, so you need to question things. And then know when using AI, when to use AI, and then when actually talking to users is needed. I think using AI every day, this is, you, every, we're all at this, um, you know, fulcrum, like where everything is kind of shifting in a large way towards AI. You're, you're obviously already like on, on this very early be the person if you aren't already that becomes the the go-to ai person at your company if you can do that lots is going to a lot is going to change but this is really going to like supercharge your career i personally use a website called the ai exchange every day um uh and i go to their website I, i'm a paid member i have their um their slack bot it's amazing it's so hard to keep up on everything that's happening so quickly, 
the AI exchange is the best way that I've found. I'm really, I, you know, if you, if you sign up and you don't like it, send me the bill. I will reimburse you. Hey, I don't really, I don't think we have any time for any questions, but I love the discussion. We're giving away two uh, pragmatic classes at the end. I think, I don't know, Casey, if, if you have any information on that. Yes, we are about to hop right back over into the main webinar and I put that link in the chat because I think we're just about to do our giveaways and it's 3.30 on the dot. So thank you so much, Dan. That was super awesome. Uh -huh.